The Morris Information is one of the most, if not the most, prolific dinosaur fossil site in the United States. It's also one of the most famous, second only to the Hell Creek Formation, and that's probably only because that's where T-Rex and Triceratops come from. Still, the Morris Information is home to many American dinosaur icons, such as Stegosaurus and Diplodocus. The Morrison dinosaurs are famous for good reason. They are some of the most completely known dinosaurs in the world, almost all of which are represented by multiple individuals, many of which depict different growth stages and sexual dimorphisms. The Morris Information covers a large amount of land stretching from Wyoming and Colorado to Utah and Oklahoma, and includes many dinosaur-yielding quarries, such as Coma Bluff, Garden Park, Dinosaur National Park, and Cleveland Lloyd. Part of the reason why so many dinosaur specimens have been found in the Morris Information was primarily because it was the stage for a very infamous quarrel between two scientists, Othniel Charles Marsh, the man here on the left, and Edward Drinker Cope, the other man who looks like Colonel Sanders. Marsh and Cope were friends once, but their different personalities and competitive disagreements in the study of biology had soured their friendship. This escalated into a battle between the two trying to one-up each other by finding new dinosaur species. This quarrel is nicknamed the Bone Wars, and as petty as it was, many of the famous American dinosaurs were found and named during this event. Unfortunately, many of these specimens were given names in haste, the aftermath of Cope and Marsh constantly wanting to find new species. Years after the Bone Wars, many of the species considered by Marsh and Cope as separate were actually synonyms of one another, like Entrodemus and Morosaurus being misidentified Allosaurus and Camarasaurus, respectively. Arguably, the biggest controversy surrounding the validity of dinosaurs found during the Bone Wars was Brontosaurus. In 1879, Marsh named a large sauropod, or long-necked dinosaur, Brontosaurus excelsus, the giant thunder lizard. The titan's bones were displayed in the American Museum of Natural History in New York. The original display is portrayed with a robust, box-like skull and a tail that dragged across the floor. Features we now know are not accurate. Brontosaurus's validity as a species was put into question by Elmer Riggs, a paleontologist who had discovered Brachiosaurus, another famous long-necked dinosaur, and was a sauropod expert in general. After close examination, Riggs came to the conclusion that Brontosaurus was synonymous with another sauropod Marsh had discovered named Apatosaurus. As such, all specimens named as Brontosaurus were reclassified into genus Apatosaurus. However, in 2015, nearly a decade later, Professor Paul Barrett and other paleontologists, after studying 81 specimens and observing specific anatomical traits, came to the conclusion that Brontosaurus was its own genus, bringing this celebrity dinosaur back as a valid species. The Morris information dates to the late Jurassic period of the Mesozoic era. At that time, North America was much closer to Europe and Asia than it is now, explaining why these continents shared similar, related species to one another. A huge gulf had been formed at the continent's center, which would only continue to fill into a huge seaway later in the Cretaceous. The western United States during the Jurassic was a semi-arid floodplain habitat, with riverine forests scattered across the flat landscape, acting as refuges for small animals. Meanwhile, the larger animals lived out in the open floodplain, with fields of ferns, cycads, and benetitalians, rather than grass. In terms of animal diversity, the Morris information is comparable to that of the modern African savanna. Today, we have fast-moving herbivores like zebras and gazelles, larger, more powerful, medium-sized herbivores like rhinos and hippos, and then the largest herbivores like elephants and giraffes. In the Jurassic, we see dinosaur versions of these mammals. Ornithopods like Camptosaurus and Dryosaurus, smaller relatives of the later famous Iguanodon, and Hadrosaurs like Parasaurolophus and Carithosaurus, filled the role of fast-moving herbivores with no major defenses outside of speed. In contrast, the well-defended Thyreophorans like Stegosaurus filled the role of medium-sized herbivores, not the biggest plant eaters in their environment, but still huge and very powerful. Finally, the sauropods like Brontosaurus and Camarasaurus were giants, titanic and powerful, hunted only by the largest and powerful of predatory dinosaur. Speaking of which, the African savanna is home to giant predators as well, 
such as big cats like lions, leopards, and cheetahs. But there are also smaller hunters and scavengers like jackals. The Morrison is home to equally huge and terrifying predatory theropod dinosaurs like Ceratosaurus, and the crown jewel of Jurassic American theropods, Allosaurus. But it is also home to smaller, feathered dinosaurs like Ornitholestes and Tanacolagrius, filling the scavenger ecological niche just as jackals do today. All of these predators living in the same place at the same time would make some question how such large carnivores coexisted with each other without confrontation. Though all of these predators are huge, they hunted different types of herbivores. Ceratosaurus was the smallest and lightest of the three, so it likely preferred ornithopod prey that were fast enough to outrun heavier theropods, but not faster species like Ceratosaurus. Megalosaurids, like Torvosaurus, usually coexisted with sauropods, in particular Cetiosaurids like Haplocanthosaurus, and were more than likely adapted to hunting them with their huge mouths filled with long, sharp teeth. Allosaurus, the largest of the three, had a mixed diet of both large sauropods like Brachiosaurus and Camarasaurus, as well as medium-sized herbivores like Stegosaurus. Older pieces of dinosaur media like Jurassic Fight Club or When Dinosaurs Roamed America often portray these giant carnivores constantly killing and eating each other, when in reality these animals would have coexisted perfectly fine, and if there were any confrontation, like, say, fighting over a carcass, it was a battle of bluffing and intimidation rather than killing and bloodshed. The bigger, powerful carnivores will get to eat first, the weaker ones have to wait their turn. Do you know the difference between Diplodocus and Brachiosaurus? Both are sauropods, sure, but they differ from each other in one way, their skulls. Brachiosaurus is a macronarian, or large-nosed sauropod. These sauropods are named from the fact that they have large nasal cavities. In older depictions, macronarian sauropods were often portrayed with the nostrils on top of their head. In reality, these nostrils were placed towards the front of the animal's head, in a normal position. Instead, these huge nasal cavities were likely used in thermoregulation, noise resonating, and attracting mates, kind of like modern male elephant seals. Diplodocus and its kin had more narrow heads, with greater emphasis on wider mouths rather than larger nostrils. So what was Stegosaurus's plates used for? Back when dinosaurs were believed to be slow and cold-blooded, scientists believed that they were used in thermoregulation, like giant biological solar panels. However, it is now commonly accepted that these plates were actually used in species recognition, intimidation, and attracting mates. Male Stegosaurus, in particular, probably had brightfully colored plates to catch the attention of females not too dissimilar to modern peacocks and their tail fans. The four huge spikes on Stegosaurus's tail, called thagomizers, could reach up to four feet in length and were likely used in defense against predators. Some Allosaurus specimens show punctured damages in their bones, likely made by a Stegosaurus tail spike. 